All right, so originally the plan today was to talk about to demo an ontology-driven interface, but since I couldn't find a good example of one, I decided to talk about question answering systems. It's my chair. <laughs> uh, so this, I actually adapted these slides from a paper uh, down here from uh, DBPDF-based uh, factoid question answering system. Uh, from these guys here at the Department of Computer Science at Biskra University in Algeria. So this paper is actually, uh, I picked it because it had, uh, it had pictures, I like that, and it also had some pretty good explanations of what they were doing. Uh, so the question answering system kind of plays into what we're talking about because uh, they're going to use an ontology, they're going to use DBpedia in this case, and, and some other cases we'll look at later, to actually answer questions. In this case, we're going to try to do this in like a free text way. So what is a question answering service? Question answering service is a question answering is an area of natural language processing research aimed at providing human users with a convenient and natural interface for accessing information. Um, we've already looked at um, Google search and uh, kind of how that works. Um, and we looked at the history of that and that we know that they used IR to generate the uh, results originally. Um, but the question answering service isn't going to give us links to websites. We want to actually get the answer in a box like, the, like Google is doing now with their, uh, uh, I don't remember what the box is called, but the box is there. It's got the answer. So in this case, the example, who was the first president of Algeria? It'd be nice to actually get the name of the person and not a bunch of links to websites. Um, increase in web data improvements in IR and natural language, natural language processing have encouraged the production of question answering systems that answer natural language questions by querying a knowledge base like Freebase or DBpedia. This is the system <coughs> that these guys produce, it's called Selmy, <coughs> and uh, I believe that means ask me in uh, Arabic, I think. And, uh, that's their interface, pretty nice. This is a little overview of their model. Uh, so you ask a question, it's kind of tokenized, do some part of speech, chunking, remove stop words, um, extract resources. Um, they have a classification, a questions model uh, that'll classify the question, basically merges all that, generates the query, executes the query, gives you the answer. So further breakdown of each step along the way. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. <clears throat> so let's jump right into how they are transforming your actual natural language question into a query that they can use, they can generate a Sparkle query from. They're going to use um, uh, support vector machines, SVM. It's a machine learning approach to classify. In this case, they're using, uh, they're going to classify two times. They're going to classify as a course class and as a fine class. So. They chose to do six <coughs> different classes here and an addition of bullying so you could say, uh, have a true or false type of question. Um, support, support vector machines are supervised learning machines based on statistical learning theory. It can be used for pattern recognition and, reg and regression. Um, I could talk about how they work if you'd like, but uh, in this case, we're basically trying to classify these using this function, and they used uh, the hyperplanes, and I'm not gonna, I actually, I'm gonna watch this video, because it's 40 seconds long, and uh, I think it will give you a, a good idea of what's going on here. So these are the documents we're trying to classify in all of these documents. <coughs> this will show you, if you're looking at it in a single plane, we wanna classify these documents somehow out of all those. So we're gonna actually make it a parabola, and take a hyperplane, and slice through this parabola here. And now we've classified our documents. So that's basically a visual representation of how the support vector machines are classifying these documents. He lays it down and now you have a nice ring. Everything that falls inside that ring can be classified as that type <coughs> of question. No, don't do that. Um, 
so they used the uh, multi-class SVM and then uh, directed the ACLA graph. Directed the ACLA graph, and cyclic graph, sorry, is a graph whose edges have an orientation and no cycle. So um, you would start here, so you're starting at, um, so you're trying to classify. You start, it could be any of these four classifications in this example. And you say, it's not that, maybe it's two or two through four. No, maybe it's three through three or four, and no, you get here. So you can go any of those, but you can never come back and start again. So it's always directed outwards, no edges, come, no arcs come in. Um, so the first step in using support vector machines is to train the classifier, um, because it is machine learning technique. Um, in this case, they use a train set of 5,500 questions and a uh, 500 questions for the testing. <coughs> so you have your test set, the train set, they both go through tokenization, removing of stop words and feature extraction. You end up with a test file and then your training file. And then we do the, the uh, directed acyclic graph training. And then you come up with a question model. And then you can do your question classification from the test file and the question model. So, <clears throat> classifying questions. Logically, the question classifier makes use of a sequence of two simple classifiers, each using the SVM. So I talked about the, originally they had, you saw two columns, they had a fine classification and a coarse classification. So the coarse cl classification would be um, the first step, and then it would classify it again uh, finer to try to extract exactly what you mean. And of course, the second one depends on the first one. <coughs> Um, they actually used EBPD Spotlight to extract the resources um, and um, extract the keywords. So when you type in your query, you're going to, they're going to ex uh, remove all the stop words, um, remove all words that are um, recognized as, as proper nouns by Spotlight, um, remove complex and nominal, uh, a complex nominal and its adjacent modifiers, all other complex nominals, all nouns and their adjective and modifiers, all other nouns and all verbs in that order. And we'll, I'll give you an example of, of exactly how this goes. So what is the largest city in China? First they select all the non-stop words, largest city China, use DB, and DBpedia to extract the proper nouns, in this case China, and then apply chunking. So the largest city and China. This is the uh, just an overview again of that larger picture for the, the question processing workflow. <coughs> so we're going to formulate the query that we're going to send to DBpedia. Um, the answer type, the resources, and the keywords. Um, in addition to those, we also need to um, determine the, the ontology classes and the properties so that we can build an appropriate Sparkle query. <coughs> so that's, uh, this is an example of how ontology class is determined. We have uh, how many people in Algeria? So <coughs> we go through the, the, the query processing and uh, we know we need Algeria. And we don't know though what properties Algeria has. So we know we have Algeria, uh, and the keywords, people, colonize, settle, populate, colonize, settle, populate, depopulate on people. And so from that we can determine ontology class population census, and then generate the Sparkle query based on the ontology class and the keywords that were presented in the query. This is a full example here of exactly what's going on. So this question is, what is the highest place of Karakorum? So they tokenize, determine part of speech, the chunk, and this is the uh, part of speech chunk. And then remove the stop words. Uh, remove the feature extraction, so Karakorum and highest place. You can see the feature set. Then 
classifier classifies the question as a course class location, and a find class other in this case. Um, the results of the resource and keywords extracted, so the focus on Karakorum, and uh, the highest place, Altitudinous Lofty, and we get these OWL classes for, um, to, for the ontology to determine the class. Sorry. <coughs> And the Sparkle generated uh, is here. And then the answer would be K2. So it just gives you the answer, no links to other sites. And that is how their question answering service worked. And I've, theirs is currently not available. Um, but in the paper, they had comparisons to other question answering systems that they also use DBpedia. And uh, if I found one of those, was still active. And actually, the other one is still active, but it was purchased by um, Amazon. And the website is kind of shady. It doesn't answer very many questions. But they apparently have a mobile app that I haven't tried that uh, tends to work like, tries to work like Surrey, basically, or um, Google Now. All right, that's it for this set of slides. Uh, I have a question. Go for it. So in the find class in this example, it says other. So how did it narrow it down? You know. That's a good question. I don't. I don't. I don't know. <clears throat> I saw that too. I think that uh, <clears throat> that they they if you can't find a narrower term, so if they couldn't use find, they tried to match with the the broader. So if you could get more focused, you can. But if the best you can do is say, in general, it's a location, then that would be what you would go with if you could find an ontology description that matched location. <coughs> Anybody else have any other questions? <coughs> New? All right. I'm actually, I am going to sit down for this part because I'm going to be typing and whatnot. It seems kind of silly to see them. So my idea for this second portion was to first talk about Talk about how Google does things, um, not as far as the knowledge graph goes. Obviously, they're using knowledge graph in place of um, DBpedia. Not that it, it also contains, it's a superset of DBpedia, Freebase, all the information that's extracted from scraping with uh, schema.org schema annotations and all of that. <clears throat> but I don't really want to talk about that because I know other people are going to talk about knowledge graph, and we've talked about it some already. So if you'd like to, these are some. What time is it? 2.15. We'll look at this one. If you'd like to, the, these websites are actually very well made, and then I enjoyed looking at the first one. That's why I put it on here. Um, so this is just the knowledge graph, and actually you'll see how you type in the query, and it provides you with the relevant information, just like a, a question answering system does, that in addition to the links, you actually get all the information that you're looking for, and also associated information. So you, and the example um, video that they post, they talk about how you might you might search for Leonardo da Vinci because he's the only Renaissance artist that you know about, but you might be wanting to explore other Renaissance artists, so they wanted to give you uh, related, related artists, related things to your query. All right. So this is a Google NLP approach. Most NLP applications such as information extraction, machine translation, sentiment analysis, and question answering require both syntactic and semantic analysis at various levels. 
Um, at the syntactic level, Google develops algorithms that uh, predict part of speech text for each word, predict the various relationships between them. <clears throat> um, historically, parsing systems were primarily um, developed in English, and that creates a problem because well, they don't scale well, and also English is a formal language is easy, fairly easy to look at, but um, slang in uh, Twitter posts and blog posts um, doesn't work well there. So at a syntactic level, their focus is to develop multilingual uh, multi linear time parsing algorithms that are robust to domain shifts. So from going between a strongly typed document, something that's formal, to a blog post, it should work between those. Algorithms that leverage large amounts of unlabeled web data, like web pages. Algorithms that can be trained to maximize application-specific performance and state-of-the-art multilingual syntactic analysis by building robust model techniques to transfer knowledge from resource-rich languages to resource-poor languages. At the semantic level, Google uh, has worked on problems like noun phrase extraction, identifying who Barack Obama is in free text, what a CEO is, what an SEO is, uh, tagging these noun phrases as either people, organizations, locations, <coughs> common nouns. Clustering noun phrases that refer to the same entity, both within and across documents. <coughs> uh, resolving mentions of entities in free text against entities in a knowledge base. Relation and knowledge <coughs> extraction, so Barack Obama is a person. Most NLP algorithms attempt to solve these problems or data from a closed domain. So these question answering systems, they can answer a question maybe if the data's in there. Google has to do these at a web scale, so they have to do them across all domains um, from different knowledge bases. Uh, this requires um, cutting edge syntactic analysis. The scale and nature of the data on the web requires that algorithms be efficient and perform well with context across uh, domains and are scalable. Um, this is a paper involving Microsoft's uh, question <coughs> answering service. So this is basically being um, how they process your natural language query to process the answer. It's not terribly different from what I, what I gave in the first set of slides, but it's an interesting read if you're interested in have time. We're going to play around with some search engines here, and I'm going to do a couple queries to show you where these question answering systems perform well compared to um, Google and where Google wipes the floor with them. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to look at is PaddyWeb, and I, I don't know that this is a question answering system specifically or what you would call it. Maybe relation mining is the best way to say it. So here we, this actually, you could enter Sparkle, basically. Um, I'm not, I'm gonna use one of their, some of their predefined questions and show you how it relates these. Instead of actually giving you the answer to the question, it's going to give you how the entities are related. So how are Hillary Clinton and Monica Lewinsky related? You see that <clears throat> it gives you Bill Clinton because Hillary Clinton was accompanied by, or I'm sorry, Bill Clinton was accompanied by Hillary Clinton. So she's related to Bill Clinton. Hillary Clinton is also related to Gore because uh, Al Gore was succeeded by Hillary Clinton. Can you scoot over a little? Oh, okay. sorry. Um, and then Monica Lewinsky also obviously attached to Bill Clinton. <laughs> okay, now it's <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Is that better? No, nope. nope. that's worse. <laughs> that's all right. I think it's, these things are funky. I know mine, mine is. Yeah. Huh? What? What's it? Oh, closer, I think is what you said. Oh. Scoot away and get closer. <laughs> Stay in that exact spot. Can you see me? Am I, all right. And everyone can see? Okay. Um, so here we have to we have to actually physically look and see that Monica Lewinsky and Hillary uh, Rodham Clinton 
are connected through Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. it, they, won't, they won't tell us that. Um, same thing with Hillary, or I'm sorry, Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise. Let's look at one that creates a more uh, robust query here, uses a join. So these are visionaries affiliated with MIT. And you can see that <coughs> basically writes a Sparkle query. I suppose that if you knew all of the relations in the Yago ontology that you could perform queries semi-effectively, but since I have no idea what's in there, what relations they have, <coughs> and how vast their database is, I, I couldn't actually write one that gave me anything of value. Does anyone want to try something? No, everyone doesn't like this one. Fair enough. I don't either. Um, let's try Power Aqua's question answering service. And they, they say that you can make use of Watson. We'll try it, but it usually crashes for me. So, um, one of the queries that I thought across all these browsers was good was what is the Tallest And one thing you'll notice with the question answering systems compared to Google is that Google would have given me the answer while I was typing, or at least tried to and changed it as I kept typing. And this will take a minute. In fact, let's go ahead and launch something else and look at that. This is a knowledge engine, and it tries to do what Google's doing with the knowledge graph as far as giving you specific answers and making the, the links to the website secondary. So this, this was fairly quick. Gave us Mount Everest, and then also gave us some web, web results. This Kakis is uh, more of a traditional question answering framework and this one gives me different answers to the question every time I type it in. The first time I typed it, it told me that English language was the tallest mountain in China. Ah, now it's Korean Peninsula. So that's... But the previous one was also wrong, right? I mean, Mount uh, Everest is in Nepal. Nepal, yeah. So where Nepal is owned by China, isn't it? No. <laughs> it's in Nepal. It's in Nepal. I'm just wondering what the source of all these. It's not DBpedia, obviously. Well, this one's supposed to be DBpedia, <laughs> but I believe the problem was lost in the translation from the, the question to the query. That's where the Selny system was, was attempting to be better than um, this system in the comparison. It wasn't necessarily the retrieval <coughs> because they're working through the same ontology. Uh, it was the, the question uh, translation. This is the EV. This was the other one that they compared to uh, at the time in 2013 when they wrote the paper, it was called True Knowledge, and it was a sense bot. <clears throat> we'll try the query here, and I believe it gives the, it gives Mount Everest. Everybody says Mount Everest. So you go, Mount Everest. It's universal. Everybody here is wrong because Google said so, and so did everyone else. And we look back, and Power Aqua is still going. So we're going to try a different question. This, uh, this question actually shows what this platform is, is best at. didn't give you all of them because it probably doesn't have all of them, but it, it actually gave you the, the answer to your question and not, not links. And then you can find out more details about them. Maybe. There you go. And video. Now if you type this into Google, it won't answer your question. It can't, it can't list for you these things. 
It can give you a website that you can go to and immediately find the answer, and probably a better answer because it's deeper. I mean, that's a lot more accurate, so it's probably more accurate. It tells you more information about them right up front. If you remove the list, if you just do actors and background, then you the list. There you go. I was trying to keep the questions consistent across all this, just to see what the performance is. We still have nothing here. It's because it's waiting for Watson. It's still, it is <laughs> waiting for Watson. Let's, I'll, I'll, we'll do a question that it can actually answer. And uh, this is the, uh, this is the most annoying one that I, I worked with, not because it, gives you wrong answers necessarily, but because um, it, it doesn't like to work. Um, if you ask, ask, and you've already an asked a question, sometimes it'll ask the same question again, even though there's different text in the search bar. That's still going. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Are interested to ask a question answering service. What is the answer to the ultimate question? <laughs> I think Wolfram Alpha would give you that. You have to say like the universe and everything. Oh, wait. To like the universe and everything? Mm -hmm. Is there an Oxford comma? Uh, honestly, I don't know whether it is or not. United States. <laughs> That's my problem with this particular system is that instead of owning up to the fact that they haven't processed your question and say, look, I can't, I, I don't know what you're asking me. Instead of saying that, they just give you some answer, which I think is giving you, is worse than giving you, you know, an I'm sorry. Now, Evie here will give you an I'm sorry. Um, I like your ideas. See, I don't have an answer for that. I didn't think about it until just now, though, but has anybody tried Wolfram Alpha for answering questions? Wolfram Alpha has some, uh, some pretty good linguistic things and some, some interesting knowledge. Um, so if you wanted to know the airspeed of a. No, you can't say European or African. You have to just say. Swallow. Yep. Coconut leaf and swallow. There you go. Estimated average cruising speed of an uh, airspeed of an unladen European swallow. And if anybody doesn't know, that's from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Um, it will also, if you ask it, I think if you ask it who the, who the baddest, uh, I don't remember how it was, but it will, it will do shaft back and forth with you if you uh, know how to type it in. Um, Power Rock was still going even though it did. So here's my, my takeaway from this and what I was trying to demonstrate by, um, by taking a look at this is that in the past, um, as the semantic web was developing, people were trying to use these dedicated ontologies and databases to answer your questions. And it's, a, it's interesting, and sometimes you can get a lot of uh, knowledge from it, but, but really, Google has it, has it made now. Because not only do they have the knowledge to back it up, but they also have the ability to cross-reference the question you're asking to the que similar questions that other people are asking and say, as you're typing it, I might already know the answer to this. I mean, just the fact that, that they can answer your question while you're typing is, is impressive. Yeah. Well, from Alfred did that for you, too. When you typed who, it immediately went to something Led Zeppelin. I don't remember what. Yeah. There it is, who wrote Stairway to Heaven. 
Apparently that's a very common question. <laughs> Um, actually, they had to give writing credit to another band recently because they stole the oh, yeah. going back to courts. <laughs> that was Is outrage. it going back to courts? Mm -hmm. You'd yeah. think after 30 years or 40 years, whatever well, they, it's been, you can't go after them legally anymore, right? Yeah, I think the guy that wrote it died and his bandmates are doing it in his honor or something. Anyway, that's completely off topic. But Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask or questions they'd like to ask a QA system? No? All right. <laughs> okay, I guess we can move to the next speaker. Thank you, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. I'm Shil Kumar. Uh, today I'll be covering the topic uh, on Chow. Challenges in, uh, challenges in uh, challenges in challenges that we face when we create knowledge graph and uh, the methods that are so far applied to solve the problems that those big challenges. And I've adapted these slides from a uh, tutorial at uh, Knowledge Discovery Metabases Conference this year, and the topic was constructing a mind with scale knowledge graphs. So the outcome of the topic today is uh, I will briefly cover what are the applications of the knowledge graph and uh, challenges and how, how do we acquire knowledge from the text and methods, methods of the methods in there. So when we see the knowledge graph, when we, uh, the current, of the evolving current knowledge, knowledge graphs are like pre-based, which is the MetaWeb initiative and uh, which is further expanded like global knowledge graph and everybody is initiated. Wikipedia, uh, and Facebook, and Diddy Graph. All these are the knowledge graphs that we have seen. And Ago is an ontology, ontology knowledge graph. And OpenIE is an open information extractor, uh, which scales to the web in order to get the unstructured uh, knowledge graph. <coughs> so, so if you see the cons uh, sample applications of knowledge graph, what we have seen in Jeremy's presentation is like question and answer systems and the Google knowledge graph, Google search list only. So if you search for an entity, it can show the information about that entity easily without even searching for that. So we can show the information proactively. And uh, if you're in social media, like Facebook, we can enable the efficient search of entity relationship between entities, like who are, how entities are related, like through structured queries. If you see an example, Sorry, here it is not visible, but I can read it. Read it for so uh, here there is a structured query saying people who like, who like Harvard University and uh, basketball and work at Facebook. So we can query the current or Facebook knowledge Facebook knowledge graph through structured queries like this. So knowledge graph generally enable all this search efficiently and in and in question question and answer systems. So we can ask uh, in the natural language, through the potential of natural language processing, we can ask the questions to Siri, applications like Siri, EBI, and the Google Voice Search. So all these are the applications of the knowledge graph. So when we talk about the, when we talk about creating the knowledge graph, so at a web scale, like we, we need to store all the knowledge that is available across, that is available across the web. So what are the major challenges that we might from across. So if we consider this, uh, the relationships that we can find in a web document are, are to be are difficult to find, like uh, the, the relationships between entities like US and uh, Express, uh, Barack Obama. How do we get the information, like they, he is the president of the United States? And how do we connect different knowledge graphs? Like there are multiple knowledge graphs, and how do we, we how are you, how can you query the data in other knowledge graphs? And uh, how do you extract the entities? Like U.S., United States, Barack Obama. How do you find these entities? And the problem is, the knowledge base will never be complete without all this information. But the data is growing day by day. That is one of the major problem, and 
After finding, extracting the, all this information, the next challenge will be the validation of that information. So if the information that we extracted should be to, to be available in our application, the, it has to be valid and it should not lead to any confusion or wrong assumptions. So the validation of the extracted information is also another challenge. And the passing of the information that we find on that for applications to access. So if Google Knowledge Gap has to be accessed, the queries that the user enters should be processed properly. So that is one of the, <coughs> these are the major challenges that we come across when we creating applications using Knowledge Gaps. So in today's discussion, I will talk about the challenges like uh, link, uh, link prediction called adding relationships and knowledge graphs and how do we extract entities and relationships from web of types <coughs> and how do we resolve the uh, resolve, resolve the entities like if there are multiple entities with similar names how do we find how do we point it to particular entity so those are the and and when we are creating the knowledge graph how do we limit how do we structure it so there are representation uh, approaches like structured and unstructured and semi-structured. So in structured, in, stru in structured knowledge bases, we will limit the type of relationships that we are adding. We will also limit the entities that we are allowing in, in the knowledge graph. That is one, that is one approach and uh, semi-structured, in, in semi-structured knowledge graphs, we will, we actually limit the type of relationships that we are adding, but we, we, we take the entities as strings, but not, we don't limit them. So, and in, in unstructured, both uh, subjects and uh, predicates are not limited. So the perfect example for a structured knowledge base is the tree base where we have even the relationships are types. So here I am showing an example of date of birth. Date of birth which takes only the expected type called mm -hmm. date time. So it takes, it has strong types uh, nature in, previous has the strong type in nature in, and it is a, so when we are planning for, when we are automatically extracting the knowledge, so what are the problems, uh, what are the limits of the automatic extraction? So uh, a manually created uh, knowledge graph uh, tree base has 637 million non-redundant facts, but a Google's knowledge wall, which has, which is automatically extracting information has 302 million high content facts. But out of those facts, it has 223 million from tree base, tree base itself. That means the approximately 35% 35% of overall Google knowledge world, like 1.3 billion facts knowledge world has actually. So there are some limits on what, uh, how automatic extraction can work. So what are the major challenges in the extraction? Like uh, if you see the relationships in the previous, the percentage of face not found for like the relationships, gender, profession, children, parents, and all these are not explicitly ma mentioned in, in anywhere in the text, but they have to be implicitly extracted. So we will see an example of what is an implicit uh, stated, in, stated information. Here uh, there is a sentence and Adam called his wife wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all Eve. So here there is an inferred statement which is not visible actually. So the spouse of Adam, is, spouse of Adam is Eve because it is clearly mentioned and also the date of So there are inferred facts from this text like God formed a man which is inferred as the gender male and uh, place of birth as Eden and date of birth as the beginning. So these are all the facts that we can extract from the extract implicitly from the text. 
So, so these kind of uh, implicit statements cannot be directly extracted. They have to be inferred from vocabulary, using vocabulary and uh, explicit rules. So after, when creating knowledge graph, there are two aspects basically. One is extraction from the text and then adding more, the, more facts to it based on extracted text. So from the extracted text when we are adding, when we are trying to discover new, new facts, the problems will be like errors in the extracted text and uh, conflicting information from the already available data on the web and opinions uh, conflict and fictional context like if the, uh, web, if the document has fictional context called let's say Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter movies uh, that can be in, from that document they make uh, refer it as Abraham Lincoln's profession is Vampire Hunter these are other problems and the spam spam data will be another problem in discovery of knowledge and these are all the <coughs> challenges that we have that are there in the entity sorry relationship extraction but when we come when we look at entities that are already extracted there might be duplicates of entities like say Wright State University can be it can be mentioned as WSU as well. But they both of them refer to the same location. Likewise, here is an example. Uh, when the in Facebook app they, they are searching for Pupi Shushi at Facebook. Pupi and but there are two entities with the same similar same address pointing to two different entities. So these are the in these are originated from different uh, different check-ins probably. And similarly, there is another uh, example of it. <coughs> Here, so these two are referring to the same location, but the, with the same syntactic difference, syntactic difference in the name. Restaurant Vego and Restaurant Vega. So, so multiple mentions of the same entity uh, will lead to confusing con confusions in the uh, in the applications. Here also another example of Mandela Tea House, which is at the one, same location as of Britila Nagatos. So entities resolution has to be done when we are creating the noisy graphs. Uh, noise graphs. But how do we solve these problems is the next part. I'll be talking about the techniques that techniques from supervised mode, techniques to solve relation uh, challenges in relation extraction and entity resolution. I'm leaving the link prediction part. So what is relation extraction? If you have three sentences like this, uh, Coke Bryant, the fantasy player of the lacquers. If you find these three sentences, hope once again save with this deal. <coughs> Man of the match for Los Angeles. So from these three statements, how can we, there are two entities, Cobrant and uh, Lakers, his team, and Los Angeles. So how do we get this to infer that he is a play, he is playing for LA Lakers? So we, uh, there are three types of uh, algorithms for supervised relation, supervised, <coughs> unsupervised, and uh, semi-supervised. Uh, in semi-supervised approaches, we can we can find the parts of speeches from the sentences. We will tag the parts of speech of the sentence and, and train the algorithms to find uh, what are what are the entities and what are the relationships. I will show you an example. So, Tom Cruise was born on July 3rd, 1962 in Chicago. This is the sentence. And these are the part of speech tagging and the relationships among them. Like, um, noun, num, numeric, all 
all these are so if you take bunch of um, bunch of sentences and par parse the and point out the speed part tag this sorry x was so we can find this one this thing like here x was born on some date and y so this is the inference this is the sentence form that we can find from part of speech tagging and from there we can find the entities and the relationship And in semi-supervised relation extraction, so here there are C triples which we know already uh, as facts. We will take some ten sentences then and say, uh, and say these are the exact patterns that I'm looking for. And then we will find match those patterns with the text that we find from across, and take them as and add these new sentences. We will like find these patterns in the text. And then add the new facts to the triple stack, and then recurrently search for the new patterns, and we will find. Uh, that's how the semi semi supervised relation extraction works. So the text runner is an example of uh, semi supervised. Uh, semi supervised. Sorry, semi supervised. It, it actually takes the. Uh, See the see the examples and then starts from there. It it also generates positive and negative examples automatically, and uh, creates the triples like from unstructured data. So this is part of uh, open information extraction that we have discussed that I have shown you in the beginning. And in distantly supervised relation extraction. The existing knowledge base is utilized to find new patterns. Like uh, facts from the existing knowledge base will be used, and based on some hypothesis, uh, hypothesis they will uh, we can actually make relationships among the entities. So here, in the, how do the model the hypothesis is? Collect main many types of entities co-occurring in sentences from text corpus. So typically, this is how uh, distance supervision works. They will, and if two entities participate in a relation, several hypotheses can be. One of one is all sentences mention them expressly. So all sentences that we come across are men are mentioning the same relationship is one hypothesis that we can take. Like Barama, Barack Obama is the party for. And the current president of the US can be inferred as Barack Obama employed by United States of America. So the hypothesis, another hypothesis. So where this can go wrong is uh, when some hypothesis model at least one sentence mentioning them explicit. Like if they consider that this one also true, uh, sentences like this one will be wrong. Like Barack Obama, Barack Obama flew back to the US on Wednesday. And uh, that is not an exact sentence that infers this triple. So the distance supervision of uh, can help in is can be easily scaled up to help and uh, the there is no supervision required here, and it can be generalized to all text and then the Rasmus supervision. And it needs exactly how exact exact matching of the entities, and sometimes the hypothesis goes wrong. That is about relation extraction. And when we come to how to solve challenges in entity resolution, like we find facts like <coughs> in two different data sets, like Kobe Kobe Bryant married to Vanessa. And there are other facts about him in different data sets. But how do we uh, find these two are referring to the same same person? Is the question. So that is the and this is the problem entity resolution. So one of the approaches is single entity entity resolution without using the context of 
where the user where where the entity is mentioned uh, we can use similarities as string similarity and uh, edit distance uh, distance measure, distance measures for resolving the problems we will see so basically uh, where is this uh, entities get duplicated duplicates are also often created during check in different spellings gps errors and wrong check ins and frequently those duplications have few attribute values names were typed hurriedly so these are the origins of the duplications when there is a bad match it is easy to find cases where the bad match pair is more similar than the good match pair and existing similarity metrics tf idf lens stand lens light edit distance generally find it to hand, handle this level of variability so how do we Check, uh, solve this problem of solving the entity resolution issue. We can find one core word, a, a, uh, like a word a human would use to refer to the place if only one, only a single word was allowed. Were allowed. So by using this thing, uh, this approach, we can find the particular word that the user may use to refer to the entity. So. Based on first one co one word is extracted from with this approach we can find the exact entity that the uh, user was referring to <coughs> and another idea is special context like <coughs> right state university and uh, WSU so somebody has wrong has checked in at the wrong place referring to right state university we can use the special context of the user based on where the geographic con from the geographic context and then solve the problem of entity duplications and convert this and try to convert the strings in those entity mentions using edit distance and then uh, try to find uh, sorry by finding the edit distance from the two strings that the user users have been using to mention to same location we can see if it is actually if they are um, similar or same or not if they are entities are referring to the same location or not so this is the results um, after final using Different approaches in a, using edit distance, TF IDF, and context model. Context model has performed well, and we can context model like spatial distance and spatial context has performed well in this thing. Yeah,